This recording is a product of Audio Anarchy. Practical Anarchism, a Guide for Daily Life, by Scott Branson. Chapter 6. Can We Still Enjoy Ourselves? Anarchy and Art. People sometimes inquire what form of government is most suitable for an artist to live under. To this question, there is only one answer. The form of government that is most suitable to the artist is no government at all. Oscar Wilde, The Soul of Man Under Socialism. Art can both reproduce and counter the dominant world. Art forms our desires and gives meaning to our daily lives. Art can play an essential role in experimenting with different ways of living. Art and Revolution? The question of art and revolution faces us with a seeming contradiction. We generally think of art as a place of creativity and imagination that counters the norms of our world, and yet we also enshrine art as the province of a select few, those with the talent, time and wealth, to make it, not to mention those with the means to buy it. In our childhood, we may be encouraged to experiment with artistic forms, but soon enough we are forced to color inside the lines, and we lose our nerve when we can't perfectly represent figures in our drawings. Later, we are exposed to art through schooling as an obligatory process of enculturation trips to the museum to see the greats, a constructed situation where you are supposed to have a particular experience of art, an experience that always feels elusive given the institutional setting. A distaste, no doubt, emerges when we lose our own initiative, when we are forced to gaze upon an exclusive world from the outside, and when a hierarchy of good and bad, high and low brow, determines our taste. The most glaring critique is that high art is a market and wealth generator for the elite, while popular culture is a money-making scheme of corporations that feed us the myths of capitalism, the police, and the state. But anarchists still cling to the liberatory possibilities of art. We make posters and patches and zines and performances. There are anarchist genres of music. Historically, punk has been a big part of contemporary anarchism, and there are ever more anarchist art collectives and printing workshops, all operating outside the institutional norms, with a DIY ethic in materials and distribution. Punk became fertile ground for an anarchist aesthetic since it was framed as an amateur genre, open to people regardless of skill or talent, tearing down the walls between performer and audience, artist and viewer, author and reader, has long been a liberatory goal, at least in theory, even for the critics who still participate in the general high art world. We can also use our anarchistic orientation to look critically at the most successful and popular art, with what Bell Hooks calls an oppositional gaze. Hooks notes that black women watch movies knowing that they are typically not the prime audience, which creates the space for an oppositional reception of the work. We know that the art world is dominated by money, and that compromises many artists, and yet we can use the art that inspires us to weave together parts and experiment with ideas that help us create visions of anarchy to empower us today and for tomorrow. We can make our own art that refuses to reproduce the world as it is, no matter whether it is figural or abstract. Art itself is its own terrain of struggle. Our engagement with cultural creations, whether we make them or enjoy them, becomes a major mode of us to disidentify, to try out our ideas of liberation, to question and experiment with different forms. In Oscar Wilde's anarchist utopian vision of the soul of man under socialism, the abolition of private property would allow for each person to become an artist. However, in this world, there would no longer be the great art that we know now, the province of the wealthy and fortunate living our lives and expressing our personality, would be art in itself. 
The daily anarchism I propose in this book takes the cue from Wilde so that a practical anarchism is itself a creative practice. We cannot give up that liberatory vision of creatively living in common. There have been more and more radical attempts to use different art forms, from music to image to narrative, to envision alternate possible worlds. Afrofuturist and indigenous speculative fiction reframes the mainstream obsession with dystopian futures by showing that apocalypse has already happened and is happening for many. But the futures, where black and indigenous people thrive, are always being created now and again. Our art doesn't have to be confined to traditional forms. As Wilde imagined, our lives are works of art. The practice of disidentifying and reorienting our relationships to others, to our place and time through care and communication, is itself an art a creative pursuit of something called living, which we have never actually known and is something we improvise as we go. As we look at modes of study outside of the process of schooling, we can rediscover the creative spark that norms dampen in us so that we can permit ourselves to create in unrecognized or unrecognizable forms. We get sold typical trajectories of life that we must measure ourselves against, but we can experiment and play with our lives, knowing there is no single right way to live. I'm not here to say don't watch movies or TV, though we must imagine a world where corporations don't control all of our time. As anarchists, we don't want to completely remove ourselves from the dominant culture, but we can see how mainstream art reflects power to us. In our disidentification, we can use anarchism as a frame of critique, just as we look at our own lives to root out the way we use power over other people. And in our anarchist reading of art, we can start to imagine other creative visions. The Problem of Representation The game of representation, where they speak in the name of and in the place of the so-called totality about the results of an exploration they haven't even made. Guy Hockenheim, Volutions Notions of identity give another layer of meaning to representation. Politically, it tends to play out as having people in power who share the identity markers of the people they wield power over, the people they allegedly represent. One less lethal way black liberation movements were dismantled in the 1970s was through a wave of elections of black mayors. But we see this push culturally, too, in the methods of signaling diversity by tokenism, advertisements and TV shows that include a black or brown or gay or trans or X person in a supporting role. This cynical measure was particularly rife after the George Floyd uprising kicked off in earnest. Netflix, Amazon, etc. had their Black Voices or Representation Matters section and movies representing black liberation as spectacle were more and more available. In this case, diversity is an illusion, a representation that mirrors no actual world or that only amplifies representation of black suffering. Still, many people see representation as a potential means of liberation. Sure, there is an undeniably powerful feeling in finding people who share the same identity markers. We might just call them markers of systematic oppression in unlikely places. It gives a sense that you are not alone in shouldering the burden or that others survive and make it into places where they have typically been excluded. In another sense, the representation of difference through cultural production, such as movies, novels, poetry, plays, paintings, and other art forms, has been, at the least, a means of communication between the elites and the oppressed, if not a strong motor of progressivist reformist change. It's true 
that narratives were a major tool in the early abolition movement, but they worked within the dehumanizing logic of settler colonialism and white supremacy. But the fact that we can try to locate liberation in representation, both politically and aesthetically, might already be symptomatic of the way that forms of power attempt to co-opt and dismantle our potential rebellion. In the 1960s, Guy Debord was already diagnosing capitalist modernity as, quote, the society of the spectacle, unquote. Another extension of Marx's idea of the commodity fetish, where our actual forms of living have been replaced by spectacle that we then consume as audience. In this view, our whole lives are inundated with representation. Everything is fully mediated, and our lives are therefore alienated away from action. The letrists and then the situationists practiced disruptions of the spectacle through détournement, which hijacked images and art from the dominant discourse to create oppositional ideas. This was part of the overall project of the Situationist International to construct situations bridging art and life and to create spaces for more immediacy and action. The practice of détournement has lived on beyond the Situationist International through the images of punk, culture jamming, and some political street art. But we may still ask whether motivating these images to liberation can't get captured again. The history of punk, for example, is tied to a history of fashion, and the subversion can be mass-marketed. There is clearly a connection between our political and cultural or aesthetic understandings of representation. Anarchists oppose deputizing power to a handful of elites through modern political systems of representation. Should we be equally suspicious of literary and visual forms of representation? We know that literature, movies, and so on do the work of ideology. Adorno and Horkheimer called this, quote, the culture industry, unquote, producing items for consumption that obscured the difference between labor and leisure, training the consumer to perform the necessary tasks of exploitation. In fact, some of the most insidious tendrils of ideology are implanted in our minds through the narratives we are told incessantly from the beginning of our lives onward. Almost no one has had a positive interaction with the police, but in children's TV shows there is invariably a friendly neighborhood cop who is a part of the world in the show. And yet, despite the ways it reproduces ideology, literature, and other representational art, still entices us and promises subversion. Is there a way to play the game of representation on our own terms? Can we tell stories that fight power, that combat ideology, that point towards our collective liberation? How do we engage with the art and culture that surrounds us as rebels? The great cultural theorist Stuart Hall provides a helpful way for approaching our enmeshment with culture and the art images and ideas that circulate within it. Representation that circulates within the realm of culture does not, according to Hall, have a fixed or final meaning. Thus, representation itself becomes a terrain of struggle, not only in producing different art forms, but also in our reception of them. Hall helps us identify different competing meanings within forms of representation, from the dominant meanings to resistant appropriations and interpretations. We don't need to be a passive audience to propaganda in the form of big-budget films, sitcoms, advertisements, or even the news. And we also have to have a keen eye for the art that gets presented to us as progressive or either liberatory, for often it finds ways to re-cement the social order as inevitable, to present social and political conflicts as magically resolved, to pacify us into passively waiting for progress. 
Since the meaning is never fixed, and the representation itself is not transparent, there are always multiple interpretations. As anarchists, we disidentify with the hegemonic meaning, read against the grain, repurpose and take what we want, discarding or critiquing the rest. And perhaps, too, in our practice of disidentification, we must refuse the terms of art, whether as a consumer or practitioner, tearing down the walls that make it seem separate from our lives. Against the Reality Principle If the meaning of art and culture is a terrain of struggle, what is at stake? Often, it's the very sense of reality itself. One of the main interventions our practical anarchism must make is in knowing that things don't have to be this way, that the dominant forms are not inevitable, and that, in fact, there are many differing worlds existing at the same time. Often the oppositional worlds get ignored, made invisible, left out of the narrative, which means we need storytellers to take up the task of retrieving counter-histories and alternative futures in their work. The dominance of realism as an aesthetic value is a major reason that art can be so disappointing politically. Good narrative art, as determined by academics and bourgeois critics, is often limited to works that reflect reality. Even the experimental forms of novels tend to be understood as innovating a more accurate portrayal of reality. In narrative art like novels and films, this means replicating the complex and adult problems of middle-class cis-hetero families. This hegemony of realism leads to the distinction between realism and genres like science fiction and fantasy as high and low genres. Worse, the hegemony of realism also obliges careerist artists to do the propaganda work of neoliberalism, fettering our imaginations to the harsh reality that there is no alternative. The realist way of writing about and painting the world fits the scientism of the 19th century. If you depict what you see, you are making a claim about objective reality. What this overlooks is the reproduction of things the way they are, including the power relations that undergird the so-called fact. While realism shifted the focus of artistic representation to previously overlooked or marginalized characters, the texture of the reality they reproduced still knitted a tight web of limited possibility for their futures. The glimpse into the lives of misery led by rural peasants might have the benefit of leading a bourgeois lady to perform charity, but we could readily critique this material in the vein of voyeurism relishing in the spectacle of suffering while shaking your head with that favorite liberal affect, moral outrage. On the other hand, the second half of the 19th century also saw a move away from realism. In the opening of what would later be called science fiction, supernatural stories, and above all, utopian literature— The legacy of early European anarchist thinking coincides with the development of imaginative literature that serves to question the philosophical and political insistence that life must be this way. In chapters 7 and 8, we see how anarchist ideas of time and space can help bring deviation from the so-called real as a way to disidentify from the power that holds us in its thrall and puts us back in touch with the power we have not ceded to the demands of the state. Description as Prescription The scheme of realist representation also served as a tool of colonial power. As Europeans invaded lands, slaughtered and enslaved the inhabitants, and extracted resources, they were also in the process of defining a concept of humanity through the not yet fully distinct fields of science and philosophy. Part of this process of normalization took place in the form of coherent narrative accounts of encounters, of individual lives. Since Europeans judged people from within their own narrow definition, being able to fit these narrative standards helped 
define a sense of humanity. For example, the early slave narratives were often framed by abolitionists as proving the full humanity of the author, while they were also subjected to doubts that people who had been enslaved were capable of writing such accounts. The narrative moved from captivity to freedom following a convention of humanization in order to elicit, quote, a sense of compassion for the miseries which the slave trade has entailed on my unfortunate countrymen. Unquote. As Olada Equiano wrote in one of the first slave narratives in English. Along with conversion to Christianity, mastering the conventions of European literature was held to be proof that people of African descent, people turned into property and forcibly enslaved, deserved dignity. Of course, this approach doesn't end up destroying the dehumanizing premise. It fits within a reformist schema by meeting the oppressor on their terms, in their language. But this itself doesn't take away the power of these texts. After apparent emancipation, this issue of representation morphed into the expectation for black authors to be representatives of their race, and for their material to focus on a highly conventionalized black experience. In Everybody's Protest Novel, James Baldwin argued against what he called the protest novel, which he traced from Uncle Tom's Cabin to Native Son as literature that might as well be a pamphlet, since it actually flattened humanity into issues. Therefore, even if there is a good political point to be made, like Stowe's novel playing a role in the historical retelling of the Civil War and Emancipation, the ultimate effect is disastrous, since it confines black experience to representations of degradation. Realist modes of representation raise problems in matters of both space and time. As we will discuss, our practical anarchism wants to multiply or stretch our sense of time to create the space for spontaneous event and to refuse pictures of how life should be. In terms of narrative time, we see that each event, whether depicted as fate or chance, seems inevitable with a backward glance. If we tell stories to make sense of our lives and experiences, giving them a stable structure also makes it easy to feel like it couldn't be another way. In terms of space, it is again a question of individual lives over many. Like the idea of an elected official representing a constituency, the limited focus of a novel swallows up the many lives that make things possible through webs of care within the depiction of the one. And just as the elected official supposedly standing in for the will of the people actually serves their own interest, or really the interest of the people who fund them, the protagonist stands in for the anonymous lives of everyone else. Not only do the lives of people who don't fit within the frame get left out completely, the protagonist is taken to be representative of a normal path for the reader or viewer to identify with. This process of representation could also be looked at like the mass-produced piece of clothing or any other consumer item. Within that shirt is a history of labor that can't be seen. The finished product pleases the eye but erases the lives and experiences of everyone along the way who had a hand in its production. Ultimately, realism entails a politics of representation, limiting the choice of what fits into the world that gets represented. Ideology works as a lens to view the world, making some things comprehensible and others absent. The dominant ideology encodes certain things as possible and other things as fantastical. The aim of the practical anarchism proposed in this book is to remove the hegemonic lens to see the world outside the structures of domination. Novels that adhere to realist values of representation therefore end up replicating the existing power structure. 
But this happens even in non-capitalist art, like the Soviet-preferred socialist realism style. The Soviets silenced artists who experimented with form and content and failed to represent the world as the protectors of Leninist or Stalinist ideology saw fit, and it made for boring art. On the other hand, if we think of anarchism as an ethical practice of liberation rather than an ideology that can be applied or replicated like socialist realism, then every choice in a novel or film or painting is imbued with liberatory or oppressive potential. When we come to read these words or to watch the films or television programs, we come outside of simple identification with the characters or the dominant narrative, holding out for places of opposition tucked within the narratives themselves. We can form counter-interpretations of art and in that perform an analysis of power systems. Often, what the Russian formalists call the estrangement of art can actually help us face the dominant meanings in a starker way, so that we can frame our alternate visions otherwise. Art for art's sake or political art? Even when realism was establishing its dominance, there were already countercurrents to its hegemony. As we mentioned, Oscar Wilde, the famous British aesthete who was put on trial for gross indecency, a version of sodomy laws, and sentenced to two years hard labor for his sexual relationships with other men, flipped the understanding of Aristotelian mimesis in his epigram, quote, Life imitates art far more than art imitates life, unquote. Though this may sound silly, Wilde's own life shows the seriousness of his claim. While on trial, he was forced to read from and defend the improper relationships between men in his novel The Picture of Dorian Gray. This novel also details the downfall of a celebrated aesthete, known for destroying the reputations of young men, so Wilde's own career was implicated in the plot of the novel. Not to simplify this relationship between Wilde's fate and Dorian's, we can see the underlying theoretical insight in Wilde's claim. We understand the world through the forms in which we perceive it, which includes artistic representation. And the art that we take in influences the way we live. Think about how our ideas of love and romance are so saturated with unquestioned lines from boring songs and romantic comedies. Realism is a tautology, even with the most liberal aspirations to evoke sympathy for the plight of the ordinary person to a middle-class readership. But Wilde's provocation part of the aesthetic and decadent movements, caused a rift in the political understanding of art. Aestheticism promised an art for art's sake as a way to dismiss the moralism of bourgeois society. But this separation seemed to mean it took no political stance. This debate heightens in the aftermath of the Bolshevik takeover of the Russian Revolution and then again after the struggles against fascism up to the mid-20th century. But the distinction between art for art's sake and politicized art created a false binary, seen to be a choice between aestheticism, which supposedly protected bourgeois values by isolating art from the world, and political art, which explicitly reflected political commitments. Like most binary choices, narrowing to two options leaves out room for complexity. Many people lumped into the art for art's sake category actually created deeply political work, especially since this attention to style was historically associated with what we might now call queer subcultures. On the other hand, overtly political art often misses the mark or ham-fistedly represents its own worldview. For example, 
Modern conceptual art often tries to make a political point, but ends up seeming self-absorbed, particularly as it often lives inside inaccessible galleries. Overall, we can see the aesthetes and decadents making a demand for beauty beyond survival. Like the famous anarchist song, We Want Bread and Roses Too. Mimi T. Nguyen insists in The Promise of Beauty that we look at how beauty keeps being claimed by the downtrodden, even as it is often used as a tool of power. Socially responsible art, which historically is focused on moral representation of life, often upholds a kind of realism as opposed to escapist fantasies. But as someone once said, quote, the usual enemies of escapism are jailers, unquote. Still, one can argue that realism is the most powerful political tool within the realm of art for upholding things the way they are. If we deem realism to be more serious than other forms of art because it represents the actual world and ostensibly all the contradictions of it, serious adult problems like infidelity, etc., this seems to demand from us that we accept the world the way it is. Scrupulous realism that tries to render mundane life in all its detail helps reproduce an ideology and a hierarchy of values. Maybe we do find a basic enjoyment in art that echoes our world back to us. But beyond that, we look to art to heighten our experience, to feel expansive possibility, to multiply our consciousness, to show that the awful world still holds some beauty. Picture the world you want. Our practical anarchist view of art then raises new questions. What if we don't represent the world with realism, reifying the way things are, but only represent the world in conflict against that, or even better, how we want it to be? More and more, it seems like the standard narrative in films and books has no reason to exist except to prop up the world as it is, to reify family structure, jobs, and life patterns, our position within the vast mechanism of the state. Every day we are inundated with narratives of inevitability. The long process of building up the state has made people more and more dependent on it, erasing stories of particularity with conventional expectations of how things must be. The seemingly innocent realm of realism turns from descriptive to prescriptive. We inherit structures of love and romance from marriage plots and pop songs. Though the mainstream world might be caught up in fears of fake news and might condemn art as escapist, we can see art instead as a place to begin practicing liberation now. There is freedom in reading. It has always been dangerous to authorities and parents, since when we read, no one else knows what is going on in our heads. Watching films, we can momentarily leave behind the boundaries of our world. We can exercise imagination to dissolve those bonds that keep us in identities, class positions, and jobs. Art is a space for us to begin our disidentification. The state consolidates its power by a sleight of hand that art can forcefully oppose. Like détournement, we can think of other ways to use the same apparatus for our own ends. The state saps people's autonomy by substituting the things we do for ourselves with bureaucratic schemes that seem to promise ongoing solutions to problems, but really just make us feel dependent on state infrastructure and powerless to combat whatever arbitrary decisions come from the top down. We have immense fear of losing whatever services or claims we can make on the state, as if there aren't long histories of these things being done by communities themselves, and as if what the state gave us was actually enough. Watch how quickly we come to believe that things can't be otherwise. 
The plots and temporality of stories transform endless possibilities into a singular outcome through all the choices that are made. We know this in our own lives. We are told we could be anything, but when we look back, we see the path we ultimately took. Books like Le Guin's The Dispossessed and Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time use a dialectical structure to transform our thinking from the closure of possibility to the opening of action. In both novels, the societies organized along anarchist ideas are set against other structures, whether the contemporary radical capitalist patriarchy or imagined versions of capitalism and state socialism. This doesn't serve merely as a comparative approach where the reader decides, I like this world better than the other. Instead, the multiplicity of worlds shows how an anarchist future is not a stable destination, but the result of actions and analysis. State thinking holds us in the everlasting structures that seem inescapable, or that suture us into inevitability. In Woman on the Edge of Time, the character Connie's experience traveling to a genderless future of loosely connected anarchist communities brings her back to her contemporary moment of oppression in the 1970s, incarcerated in a mental institution, and from her experience, she chooses a political act of revenge. The novel frames her unique personal act as inextricably linked with the opening of that beautiful future, even though she believes her life of abuse and neglect and state oppression is meaningless. Art, whether we make it or enjoy it, can be a means to reject what we are given to reject the false choices we are asked to make, and to begin to alter reality and reject the stranglehold of realism. We can even reject the art forms given to us to consume. The positive side of this would be the imagining of other possible worlds, even if it is shifting certain key details. In the aesthetic worlds we create, why would we need to have, for example, police acting the way they do in our world without active resistance? Why wouldn't there always be burning cop cars? Why would we represent the stifling aspects of the nuclear family as forever inescapable? Why have relationships stabilized in monogamous, cis-heteronormative couplings? Why would we represent the inevitable progress of Western democracies into fascist rule rather than processes of liberation? If our art is still beholden to representation, an undead relic of the 19th century, then we can use the naturalizing power of representative art to enact the different ways we want to live, whether that is in the way we represent queer trans characters without major introductions, caveats, or explanations, or the way we show worlds without jails and police and government. But beyond this, the art we make and enjoy will negate what exists so we can escape. Abstraction and Difficult Art We can also look to abstract visual art, along with experimental music and contemporary poetry, art forms that get classified as bourgeois and or inaccessible. In the heyday of abstract expressionism, many of the artists called themselves anarchists. For example, Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. And yet, the seemingly contentless art was seen by the CIA as an effective tool to combat potentially radical communist or socialist art, mostly expressed in forms of realism, Diego Rivera's murals, Richard Wright's novels leading the CIA to find ways to fund and promote abstract expressionism. But I want to make a case for the liberatory potential of abstract or experimental art. Perhaps a common experience is picking up a poem or looking at an abstract painting and feeling immediately shut down. I don't get it. 
We are trained to look for deeper meaning in art, and when this meaning isn't apparent, when the typical cues of figural representation or common syntax are missing, we feel lost. This experience can make us feel stupid or like the art is not made for us. In fact, this experience of exclusion has been used by the purveyors of highbrow art, whether gallerists trying to make money or academics trying to find a subject of study to cement their career as a way to raise the stock in high art as a cultural value. However, as part of our practice of disidentification, we can refuse this exclusion and reorient our experience of art. When faced with art we don't immediately get, we might then find different ways that we respond to it. A language poem without clear syntax might create strange associations and meanings. An abstract painting or noise music might produce heightened feelings and attention if we open our ears and our eyes differently. In the relief from needing to represent content or to replicate expected forms, these more, quote, difficult, unquote, art forms put the prime space of interpretation in the momentary relationship that the viewer, reader, or listener has with the piece. We become the ultimate arbiter of the piece, and that might change moment to moment. In this moment, I find myself reactive to it. It's an experience, even a situation, not a meaning. In this other moment, I reject its noise and the way it makes me feel. This kind of work takes away the authority of the artist who offers the gestures that get frozen in space or time, and we can receive the gift in relation to however we feel at the moment. The roles of guest and host switch. We enter the house as guest and then become host, like Mrs. Dalloway, weaving a moment of coincidence and escape that ultimately lets us go. We need to call on art to become a place of disidentifying. Not identifying with a hero or main character, not locking ourselves up in neat boxes of pride and oppression, not identifying with the power structures and sources of dominance in family, gender, sexuality, race, and class. We want art that gives us a place to remove ourselves from identification with power, with the state, with conventions and plots. We want tastes and glimpses and foreshadowing of exercising our own power. We want art that opens us up to action, not to enlist us in a preordained future, but to the indefinite and indescribable horizon of alternatives, to the strangulating misery of what we are told must be. This comes from recognizing our own irreplaceability in self and community, so we can see that every act accumulates towards an unpredictable future, and that there is no essential separation between the powerful and powerless, or between what is and what might be. Frequently Asked Questions Isn't art a waste of time? Well, is wasting time so bad? That question comes from an overemphasis on productivity and work. Often, politically-minded people act like art is merely escapism, stealing attention away from real-world problems, while we have to insist that the pleasure of art is a necessity of life in its own right. We can also insist that art plays a role in our alternative world-building efforts. Furthermore, we might try to redefine what art is taking it out of the high cultural protection of academics, critics, museums, and the market to reposition it as certain kinds of activity and things we make to add pleasure and meaning to our life and our environment. In that definition, everyone is an artist, and life actually consists of artistic actions. Can I watch Guilty Pleasures, Trashy TV, Netflix... While we might do well to be wary of the ways that corporate entertainment helps to fasten us into our scheduled lives of work and leisure, 
we also can't pretend that we can escape the impact of these cultural products on our lives. We live in a society, as the meme says. Sometimes I relate to these kinds of entertainment, specifically like a drug. I seek it for a certain effect, usually a feeling of unplugging from work life and other demands. On the other hand, mainstream entertainment gives us a sense of the cultural atmosphere and how much work goes into maintaining the status quo through representation. We can watch these things with a critical eye and for entertainment, to see how we are manipulated in every corner of our lives. We can enjoy ourselves while not identifying with the world this entertainment wants to preserve. So ends Chapter 6 of Scott Branson's Practical Anarchism, A Guide for Daily Life. As always, I'll leave you with my thoughts. I um, think that Branson here uh, has some interesting thoughts on art in general. Um, I, kind of, I tend to agree. I really enjoy personally, quote-unquote, difficult art. Um, some of my fam- favorite poets are ones that are just needlessly dense and complex. Um, in fact, one of my, my like my very favorite poet is a terrible person, a fascist sympathizer, T.S. Eliot. Piece of garbage, human human trash. Really do like his poetry. The stuff that's not fascist and racist, that is. Um, <laughs> some of the stuff n- not so not so hot, but like the wasteland, it's amazing. Um, yeah, there's actually a YouTube video essayist who talks about how much The Wasteland sucks as a poem, and I complete, totally disagree. Uh, it rules. <laughs> it slaps start to finish. It's uh, a, a jumble of incoherent images uh, from a shattered world. I love it. But my, my point is there are lots of ways to enjoy art, and it is important in our lives. And, yeah, I like the Branson's address of... Um, it, is art a waste of time? The two-pronged approach. Number one, no. But number two, this is this productivity mindset is destructive. It will break your psyche. Um, and everybody wants to work to make change in the world, but you can't. You just can't work all the time. What's the point? You, your, your life gets to have value and joy in it, too. A little bit. Come on. Um, I, I sort of disagree with Branson's... Well, I, I both agree and disagree, actually, with Branson's assessment that art values, like, realism and that this is bad um, and, and necessarily reinforces existing hierarchies. I don't think that realism necessarily enforces reinforces them even through representation um but then again you know you have to look at art with a critical eye and actually examine the function of those structures within the art even realistically uh depicted like i think that Something can. Cont- I, I have this. Okay, so I used to give an exam in my English class, and there was this very anti-war poem about. Uh, it was called "Ode to a Drone." Um, it is a beautiful poem, terrifying and and just really evocative and awful. Um, look it up; it's great. Uh, but on my exam, I asked this question: Is this poem? critical or supportive of warfare and it was a pretty open-ended question it was also like why do you think that you know um and i would give people credit for the most part uh whichever answer they gave but you get less credit if if you say supportive and here's why uh because the poem was so clearly clearly anti-war it called the uh, um, it, it describes the drone pilot as an I- I- a fool of God, idiot savant, sucking your benumbed gamer's thumb. Like it's very like cl- like you could not be more clear. But people would write, and you know these are kids, so it's not like they're fully developed, uh, 
the frontal lobes uh, are quite ready for you know the critical thinking I might expect of somebody who who whose brain is fully developed but still a lot of them would say well this poem has warfare in it and therefore it is supportive of war and it's like well no that's not how anything works um although Kurt Vonnegut would argue that uh you can't write an anti-war novel. Uh, he tried, and he said his wife said, it'll only look cool. And he's like, I tried, and I failed. <laughs> um, it is impossible not to make war look glamorous in your retelling. Um, and I think that that is... <clears throat> I don't like prescriptive statements like that. I understand that it is difficult to write anti-war material that carries the effect and doesn't accidentally communicate the opposite message you intend. I mean, you know, lots of fiction has done that, uh, from Fight Club to American Psycho to uh, things that aren't by uh, Polinuk or Brett Easton Ellis. Um, the Animal Farm, um, 1984. I mean, there's many, many things that aren't by George Orwell. Many uh, pieces of fiction that have been misinterpreted um, sometimes by their own authors in the case of Rowling for example uh, there's you know lots of lots of absolutely buck wild readings of texts um, but that that's that's always going to be the case um, whether you're writing realist or anti-realist fiction people will, read into things what they wish to see there. Uh, you know, no matter what subject you're exploring. I think, you know, people love the cyberpunk aesthetic and are like, cool, but like cyberpunk describes a dystopia, uh, probably the most possible one, where uh, corporations end up taking complete control of every aspect of human life. Uh, which, you know, we couldn't imagine something like that. But, you know, to to celebrate that aesthetic and be like, oh, man, wouldn't it be cool to have, like, bionic eyes? Like, you, you're missing the, the point. Um, those eyes are owned by a corporation that now owns you. Like, what are you talking about? So, you know... That that now to be fair, cyberpunk uh, is as a specific example, like Neuromancer or something, is written at, in kind of reaction to this hypercapitalism, especially in the eighties. But it, it's that's not, I don't think, the the sort of imaginative, uh, liberatory fiction that that Branson is talking about here. He's talking more about um, fiction that reimagines a world, perhaps even outside of the conflicts we see in our own reality something that that could be which i think is is beautiful and would be joyful it is not the only kind of art um but it is art that should exist and be celebrated and there is in academia a certain uh preference for realistic fiction it's it's called uh it, it's something that you hear less from younger and more um no, that's not necessarily true, but I, I tend to hear it less from younger and more uh, thoughtful critics who have, like, engaged with deconstruction and post-colonialism and understand that <laughs> things are complicated and that values and hierarchical systems are arbitrary and oppressive. But <clears throat> there is a, there is a like, valuation where, where realistic fiction, fiction that, that might win, you know, a, a Nobel Prize or something or, or, a, or a Pulitzer is referred to as literary fiction versus genre fiction or popular fiction or, or whatever. Um, and the distinction is not that useful. Um, and, but that word literary fiction clearly has this, this valuative, uh, bent to it and that's certainly a mark of institutional hegemony but anyhow i'm sort of rambling on this i, I felt that the uh, chapter itself um along the same lines as my main criticisms of uh this particular book so far it, it is again 
a very impractical approach to practical anarchism. I like that this gets a little more specific into what kinds of art are possible. But again, like, it is a, it's more, it's the practicality of practical anarchism is more about shifting your mindset to a more constant vigilance um, in all aspects of life, which I think is important. I think it's a, I think it's a misnomer uh, to call it practical anarchism, but I do think that is useful. So looking and viewing media critically while still being able to enjoy it and not just be miserable all the time um, is valuable and important, and it is healthy not to be miserable all the time. You're not, your brain is not helped psychologically by feeling one extreme emotion constantly. Um, emotions are quite useful, all of them. You have to feel happiness and sorrow and fear and excitement and joy and pain. You have to feel those things to have lived a life. You have to fail to live a life. You have to succeed to live a life. You have to, I mean, what's the point without without these things that, that make our experiences meaningful, these emotions? But to feel one of them all the time is exhausting. And you can't, I won't say you can't. I don't mean to be prescriptive here, but I don't think it is healthy to do. But what is healthy to do is to thank my patrons on Patreon for continuing to make this channel possible. Thank you very much to Matthew Devino, Catherine Wally, Antonio Jimenez, Jungo, Daphne Lopez, Rock Diesel, Moby Bongo, Jordan Peterson's Pharmacist, Violet, Jacob Jubeck, and Bonnie. Thank you all so much for your continued support. It means the world to me. Um, that's going to do it for me. Go ahead and get out there and seize the means of production, my little anarchist friends. <laughs>